This is Charlie Veda and Mike Larson, imposter polluting Tor metadata. Awesome, thank you. Awesome, thank you. All right, we know this is going to get a lot of press attention. We want you all to use our logo. If anything you write about this, please. All right, we're going to move quick because we appreciate that you're busy. So the TLDR is that intrusion detection systems can and do sniff out to our users and we think that's bullshit. So we brought false positives for everybody. Um, the Tor overview, there's directory authorities, you get a consensus doc that your client caches and uh, it's so similar to HTTPS, HTTP and HTTPS that we can make your web browser generate false positives in an IDS. We understand there's always opportunity cost, so we've made some attempts to reduce it. Other talks going on at the conference that you're missing. It's up. There's some car hacking going on. Uh, we decided to uh, cover the physical portion of the you know, attack vectors related to car hacking. So. Oh, what's happening? Oh, God, what about your jeans? What about your gosh? They covered the digital part when full coverage for car attacks. All right. Well, I'm the I'm the graphic designer. I created that awesome logo that you saw. I, I dabble in security because privacy is the utmost importance. Yeah, so we're, just like you, we're interested in security and privacy, but we're also interested in arts and crafts. Here's one of our projects. Oh yeah, the the fake the badge contest. If you go to Goon and show them your fake badge, you win a black badge. So, to do that. Okay, so if you download Tor, warning number six of six on the download page is that uh, the fact that you're using Tor. Like it provides anonymity in the sense that uh, people monitoring the wire can't see where you're going, but it doesn't hide the fact that you're using Tor. So the wording on this is a little um, is a little vague on the web page, but essentially it means an IDS uh, can detect they're using Tor and log it. And sometimes this can have real consequences, like in the case of the Harvard bomb threat kid. So if you're unfamiliar, kid wanted to get out of finals. He sent an email via Gorilla Mail connecting over Tor. Turns out he was one of the handful of Tor users on the Harvard campus at the time. So the same day they were able to track down through the logs and interview him and get a confession, although he hasn't been formally indicted yet. Is Tor safe? That depends on what safe means. I'm saying Tor, they're pretty upfront with what it's designed to do and what it's not. There's been quite a few talks about that. And so Runa Sandvik from the Tor project presented a, a very good talk last year that you all should watch if you're curious. Endpoint security is still important. Uh, if you got vulnerabilities in the software that you're using, that could um, obviously be exploited. Uh, for example, uh, Onion Browser and uh, the uh, Firefox exploit that you may be familiar with. To help with that, there's a portal. There's a person named Grug Q. The Grug. The the Grug. Okay. Yeah, All right. yeah. So he has a device that uh, you put upstream, and if your endpoints were compromised, it end up uh, not leaking any uh, data. All right. So we brought a portal of Pi to give away. Um, it's supposed to be for certified Unix network technicians only. Um, but we're just going to give it away to somebody in the audience. We think it's fine because a lot of y'all look like cunts. Uh, so the the bridging issue defaults matter uh, as it's set up. If you were to use it by default, or um, creates a bunch of signatures that will show how we're they're getting caught. But 
if you use these pluggable transports uh, that use various forms of steganography, uh, they can be used to um, obfuscate the fact that you are connecting to Tor, but that is not one of the direct goals of Tor itself, to be clear. Okay, so we're going to show some signatures here in a few minutes, and when you initially look at them, it's a little confusing because they're matching different pieces in different places. And essentially, they fall in these three categories, either clients connecting to the Tor network or connections coming from the Tor network or leaking information, stuff that should have, traffic that should have been routed over a Tor tunnel but was not. Um, IDS is sort of a boring blue team thing and a lot of y'all may not bother to keep up to date with the latest in IDS news. So we're going to start, like if you're not familiar with the 1998 insertion of Asian denial of service paper, it's worth reading even now. Um, and then nothing happened for a couple of years. It's comprehensive history here we assembled. Um, finally like in 2004, still nothing happened. Um, nothing happened for a while, and then last year Cisco bought SourceFire for 2.7 billion. Came right. an explosion. Sure. So you're up to date on what's been happening with IDS. <laughs> so there's some example rules that will will trigger using Snort. Uh, the highlighted uh, red portion is all that it takes to trigger. Uh, an alert which would be supportive of someone using Tor at that time. Um, you can see the ex example rules there and the uh, JavaScript at the bottom is uh, what we have uh, assembled to induce those quote false positives. And it's important to note that these VRT rules actually probably aren't going to work in a default client configuration. Like in the example of the first one, it's just matching that straight HTTP content but um, from the directory specification, but that traffic now by default it goes over like a one hop to our circuit. In the second case, this has been the signature, while it's still in the official VRT rules, um, would only match like a Tor 0.1 client when there is still client certificate validation. You can read about that at the link there. Some more rules matching binary content. The like O5 hex onion is matching like the dot onion that you see in DNS. Same thing on for exit that you see in red. Yeah, and if you're not familiar with reading snort rules, the piece between the pipes is just uh, a raw match on a hex representation of bytes. So the 10 bytes are just straight from the, the DNS flags. And I revoke when I said dot, there's no dot. Yeah, there's no dot. The, um, the number ahead of the TLD is just the length of the TLD. Um, and that's straight from the RFC. Um, so for this one, ETOpen also has a bunch of rules that's detecting traffic from Tor nodes. Like as we mentioned very quickly in the discussion at the beginning, there's uh, it's the uh, Tor relays and the Tor exits are all, it's all published information. Um, so in this case, you see this is just uh, an example of hundreds and hundreds of straight IP match rules for traffic source from Tor nodes. So in the case of um, the first one, we need to make a TCP connection from a Tor node to your host to generate the false positive. Um, so in that case, what we did is there's our Tor relay that we stood up called Imposter, and on there is running a web server. Um, that this is just the um, source code, it's just showing it's going to connect back to you when you connect to it. So this will gen generate a hit on that ET open signature uh, showing a connection from the Tor network to you. In the second case, it's a little bit more difficult to generate UDP traffic from JavaScript from your browser. Um, so what we did to get a UDP packet is we looked at some of the relays, some of the relays also happen to be DNS servers. Um, so we set up some lame delegations under the domain lame delegation dash lame dash delegation dot net and uh, did some, added some host names that point to these Tor nodes, they're also DNS servers so when you look up those domains, your domain server is going to get an X domain response from those boxes generating a Tor alert sourced from the Tor network destined for your DNS, your recursive DNS server. 
Oh, and um, I guess I should actually show that that's in place. So this is the Tor node. This is the IP address. This is the emerging threads. And it's in the list of hundreds and hundreds of Tor nodes that come with that rule set. Another IDS, bro. This is uh, the code that matches. Uh, is this the certain? It's the subject initial. What was that? Go ahead and take it. Oh. <laughs> okay, it's just matching the uh, the subject and issuer from the TLS handshake because there's um, Tor does not use valid host names. It uses just sort of a random string of characters. Um, so it looks for those weird looking certs and if there's enough of them, um, bro will send an alert. But because it's just a TLS handshake that it's matching on, you can just point your browser to any Tor node, make that TLS handshake and trigger that alert. A lot of pros and cons to using JavaScript. Uh, the publishing part is probably the most relevant. Um, this can be induced through cross-site scripting. For example, when it frames someone, if they're you know, on the Tor network, a lot of people use time correlation. Uh, Add networks, that's another source that you can use to get this JavaScript code running that would induce these um, IDS alerts. And there's some examples. You just essentially plug that into your code on your site, internet, wherever you want to have these uh, alerts triggered, um, and uh, you'll start generating the uh, alerts on the on the NIDs. So all of the users of your website can become fake Tor users, providing coverage from for everybody that uses Tor from those networks. And I would totally trust us to host that JavaScript. I wouldn't recommend pulling it down or auditing it yourself. So there's a few uh, limitations uh, we had to work around here. Um, here's a list of them. So like XHR, you can't write arbitrary headers. So there's things like the user agent that the spec doesn't allow you to overwrite. So that has to come from the browser. The browser can't make just arbitrary connections to TCP ports. There's a handful that are prohibited. There's a blacklist of ports. There used to be attacks, cross protocol scripting attacks that allowed you to like send an email from a browser by pointing it to an IP address, port 25, posting, and hoping that the mail server would like ignore all the HTTP header information and just match the ASCII text of the post body. Um, so a list of those ports, you can find them in the tangled web. Um, from a browser JavaScript perspective, you don't have a lot of ability to generate UDP traffic, but of course all the matches, Tor doesn't tunnel UDP, all the matches are probably just going to be DNS and uh, of course you can generate DNS traffic. And there's also a challenge in getting like for the first batch of signatures we saw um, where we're just matching simple bytes like get to our server, it's hard to, from an HTTPS site to generate um, clear text traffic because the uh, mixed content warnings are pretty robust. They follow all sorts of weird use cases like following redirects, um, calling other protocols, calling web sockets. Like you can't call a, a non encrypted web socket from an encrypted site. Um, so if you have suggestions on getting around mixed content warning, we'd like to hear them. Um, There's various other detection techniques. Um, here's, a, here's a few. There was a time synchronization one published. There was the TBB user agent and uh, 512 byte cells. You want to cover those in any detail? There's the URLs if you need to. So I, I think the most out. interesting one is the user agent. So the Tor browser has a fixed user agent that's like a trade off to, uh, to prevent fingerprinting. Like if you're familiar with the Panoptical, Panopticlick project, like. Uh, there's a lot to identify you in uh, a normal browser user agent or a combination of installed plugins, things like that. Yeah, so this is all generic. Like essentially all you need is a device with a TCP IP stack that 
is would take data from a protocol and end up connecting to an arbitrary host with some data. So we just, you know, this would apply uh, to any of those protocols. Uh, we just abused browsers because they're really popular. Um, um, but there's, so that introduces this question, is it possible to write any rules that cannot be spoofed? Yes, there is if people change the protocols, but it, it does a lot already. Okay. Um, so what we'd like you to do is go to the website imposter.io and let us know if it triggers IDS alerts, if you're responsible for security infrastructure. Um, if it doesn't work, uh, take a look yourself, let us know what you think the, the traffic should be and uh, there's contact information on the website. I'd be happy to help you. We'd be happy to help you figure out how to generate uh, matches against your closed source tools. Um, if you want to help, again, visit the website and support the Tor project. Um, one key part about supporting anonymity online is here it's a very popular opinion, but when you get back to the real world, um, a lot of people, it's not a popular opinion. A lot of people are more worried about terrorists and pedophiles than supporting freedom online. All right, there's a quick summary. If you have questions, meet us in the chill out room after this talk. And thank you very much. And we have uh, some important research introduced from our colleague Joe. Okay, guys, this is about to be some heavy shit here. This is what gets See, deep. When we were doing this tour stuff, we ran into these packets and we were going through these leaked documents that uh, Snowden let us view. And turns out there's these walking bipedal nuclear tanks. And uh, there's a codename Metal Gear. And we were going through these packets and they seem to be using this old game protocol as a stego to hide their real, their real process. And as we were going through this, we started to see these repeating pipes. Now, little did we know, it has something to do with bitwise operators and exclusive stuff. So we outsourced it to Snowden, and he actually figured it out for us. And it's this thing called XOR. So we're now able to read their, their traffic with these nuclear tanks. And supposedly, they want us to think that somebody reverse engineered these video games and the network protocol, and if you hack your PS2 and PS3, you're going to start playing this game again, but that's not the truth. So we're going to go ahead and describe this protocol for you so you can start checking it out and actually find out the truth. <laughs> <laughs> so there's these command identifiers right here and they tell the client what it's actually going to do and the payloads will be in the end and there's an MD5 checksum that will do verifications across them. All you have to do is MD5 the payload with the command header and you're good to go. So you can go ahead and hop on this and actually find out what they're actually doing with Metal Gear. Supposedly there's a uh, amphibious one that's going to be coming out soon. And just go ahead and start exploring from there. Fucking chemtrails, man.